Good Thursday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com mailbag podcast presented by our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Check them out online at BlueWaterClimateControl.com or you can give them a buzz at 865-299-2290. Don't forget right now that they have their um, winter maintenance schedule going on that uh, the guaranteed heating tune-ups uh, taking place in January and February. Check them out for all the details on that. You can check them out online. You can book that appointment online as well. If you book online, there's a savings of 10% on repairs, $30 on service plans, 25% on maintenance as well. And of course, I've been telling you about that split unit that they have for the smaller rooms in your house. Be sure and check those out if that fits your needs as well. That's at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com with Austin Price and Rob Lewis. I'm Brent Hubbs. Plenty of questions to get to in the mailbag podcast. So let's get cranked up and uh, ready to roll as best as we can. We'll start with S. Pitt Vol. Now that it appears J Pruitt will be back in 2021, can you talk about the quarterback room for next season? Who starts? Do they play multiple guys? Well, I mean, I don't necessarily – I mean, I, I don't know if – I mean, that you can just chalk it up as Pruitt's back just because they hired Kevin Steele. Um, you know, I mean – uh, we, our stance has kind of been the same since its beginning. It all depends on what they uncover in the investigation. You know, the, interviewing Coach Pruitt today, interviewing other people today. We'll see what comes out of it and uh, and go from there. But uh, it, providing that Coach Pruitt is back, you know, the, the quarterback room shapes up as this. You've got two athletic guys in Hayden Ho or Hendon Hooker and um, Caden Salter. And then you've got Harrison Bailey, who's more your pro-style prototypical drop back passer. So um, there's some diversity there as far as like different style of games. You know, I, I think that it sets up for Hendon Hooker, who's got more experience than the other two. That's just how I, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying he's a locked in starter, but I mean, just going off experience, you know, he, he will have played a lot more football at the college level than either other guys. I think it's going to be really interesting with that room, um, regardless of, of, kind of what what coaching situation is from the standpoint of this Rob you got some different styles in that room Salter and, and Hooker um, have legs you know they, they can that they can use to their weapon well, Bailey doesn't have that so what's your offensive philosophy style identity going to be how different is it going to be depending on quarterback would you change style greatly if you played multiple quarterbacks in a game I think all of that is stuff you can experiment with and look at as you go through spring practice since all those guys are going to be here for spring practice. I think it's a big deal to get Hooker and Salter here for spring to go through those 15 days of workouts. Yeah, I agree. Especially, you know, new system for both guys from the standpoint of Salter being a freshman. I kind of lean towards Bailey starting just because of what we saw at the end of the year. I think the ex experience factor is going to be huge. And, um, but, I mean, I think he'll get pushed and I think they'll play multiple guys. I just, I think game one, he's a starter, but, I'll be surprised. I'd, I'd be very surprised if they didn't play more more than one guy. And I'm really, and I'm fascinated by Salter, man. I think he's got tons of potential. Just let's go. Let's go double play. or nothing on our golf bet, Rob. I'll take the field, and you take Harrison Bailey. No, no, you took you took Hooker earlier, AP. I, well, I, I will. I will take Hooker. Yes, but okay. I just I, I just think they're going to go with a more athletic quarterback. Okay, I got you. I won't begin. I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet a nickel on that. That's just my opinion. Sitting here and. In January, I mean, well, I think they could go a lot of ways. And depends on what they want their offensive identity to be. I think it's a big part of that as well. All right. No, clear, to... Clearly, Rob only wants to lose a dozen baladas or so instead of. Hey, by the way, I did get a text from uh, our good vault, good friend uh, Baltimore. And when can I start? They said that they can uh, they can find you some balada balls. Uh, awesome. You know, they have. They, do they have those in the closet with a a um, unopened box set of? Wax cards from Donruss, 1994 set or 84 top Greg, baseball cards. With a Greg Jeffries rated rookie. Yeah. With a Greg Jeffries rated rookie. <laughs> Future stars, Bo Jackson. Um, I heart balls. On the telecast of Saturday's game against a and the commentators told a story about Santiago using the name Bob when he orders takeout uh, or orders Starbucks. Got me thinking most of all fans and mine and Brent's demographic are familiar with nicknames such as J-Train, Iceman, uh, Wheezy Chisholm, but in interacting with players from sports over the years, what are some of the more interesting nicknames you've heard that may not be common knowledge or stories such as Bob that you can share? First of all, Casey didn't like the nickname Iceman. Um, he was never a fan of that. Um, he, he didn't. Nope. He, he didn't. Joey Freshwater. <laughs> he didn't get down Joey Freshwater. There you go. Um, 
we some of us some of us dubbed Dante Stallworth the Green Hornet for the first two years and that he was at Tennessee because he was always in a green jersey. He was always hurt, it seemed like. And uh, Kevin O'Neill called Aaron Green hee haw for four for <laughs> three years that he was his coach. Um, I'm not sure that he liked that, but he called him hee haw the, the entire time. So those are a couple that jump uh, out at me, nickname wise. This was one that his teammates called him, but one former assistant coach who may or may not be a head coach in the ACC now. I used to refer to Duke Cruz as the paper gangster. The paper gangster. Nice. All right. We'll, we'll move on here. What are some prospective names for O-line and D-line coach? And with that, what is the timeline? I still coach D-line before. If it's still dependent on the investigation, I get that too. Keep up the good work. Um, look, the D-line, everybody's talking about Rodney Garner, right? Um, if Brian Niedermeyer's contract's up yeah, in a month and that's not renewed, then Kevin Steele's going to coach linebackers. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Kevin, Kevin Steele will coach linebackers going forward. I mean, like, that's an easy connect the dot. And, and, and you know, we'll see elsewhere. I mean, Rodney Garner makes sense. Does somebody else make a run at Rodney? I don't know. But I do know that, you know, Kevin Steele's going to lean on him heavy. Jeremy Pruitt would like him here. And, um, you know, and, and then as far as offensive line, Coach Pruitt it continues to have different um, to, to have different people in. You know, he obviously had the assistant offensive line coach for um, for the Colts in earlier this week. He had in um, the off- the new offensive line coach for uh, you know Kansas. You know, um, who you know worked at Texas A and M, then was at Charlotte. He's a younger guy named Lee. I can't think of his last name. Um, he was in for a, an interview on the, on Wednesday. So um, I, I don't, I don't think he's anywhere close to making an offensive line higher. I think that, you know, that's probably a week or two away. Big orange possible to know how far does the hiring of steel go to squash rumors of some of our linebackers considering transferring, or is it more about Pruitt for them? I think it's, I, I think it calms a little cause he's got a reputation, but at the same time, you know, <clears throat> I think everybody on this team is waiting to see what happens with coach Pruitt. I mean, you know, you know, I think Henry is a guy that, you know, could potentially go into the portal if, you know, things went a certain way. Um, you know, Kovars Crouch, obviously, we know is, is getting tugged at by North Carolina, but I mean, he's remained firm. He watched the national championship game over at Coach Pruitt's house along with several of the players on Monday night. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, Kevin still definitely calms the room, but at the same time, there's still some angst there, uh, you know, kind of watching how all this plays out. And Kevin Steele will make quick phone calls with those guys and will try to get, I'm sure, as much interaction with him, with them as he can, whether that's a Zoom call or, or whatever the case may be. He will, he will interact with those guys. As most of them are, 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 those guys are scheduled to be back in town, all of them this weekend to get ready to go to school next week. Of course, as you mentioned, Crouch already in town. So we'll see. Um, I, I think that, I think that you're going to have to recruit a lot of guys on this team and, and, and settle that stuff down because a lot of these guys are, are worried and, and unsure about what's going to happen moving forward. As they uh, should be. I sure. Mean, there's too many questions. Yeah, no, no doubt. That's why this thing's got to get resolved at some point sooner rather than later. Um, all right, UT Vol 0206, does Pruitt have a chief of staff for the program? Not a general manager uh, role involved with the roster, but a true number two off the field who manages and implements off the field priorities. Uh, Myra Miles, Todd Watson, Andrew Warshaw have titles close to this role, but not specifically. If he doesn't, in my opinion, this should be part of the plan, as Brent has mentioned previously. I believe organizational structure that would enable him to truly sustain his focus on the field while knowing other elements are being pursued to his liking. Um, you know, I, I, I think Jeremy Pruitt is a very hands-on person and is going to be a very hands-on person. Uh, do I think that he uh, could, could stand to have somebody in, in a role like that that he gave a little more responsibility and trust to? Probably wouldn't hurt him, Austin, from an organizational no, standpoint. He, he does need at all. He needs a Woody McCorby type guy. Yeah, I you agree. know, I, I, that's, you know a, I, that's a good way to put. It. I wouldn't take his name. It's right though. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, I think he needs an older guy that can check him at the door. And that's not to say Coach Pruitt's out of control because I don't believe that to be the case. But my point being is, you know, you just need somebody that you you know that's not a good idea. That's a great idea. You know, I mean, like. You know, I think you ultimately need somebody like that in all in, in all forms of life. I mean, here at VolQuest, that's why we have me. I mean, I like hubs. That's a dumbass idea, you know. But you know, I, yeah. I think 
I don't think the organizational flowchart has you in that role. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you know, Rob, it's interesting because that's one of the differences in a guy like Rick Barnes and Jeremy Pruitt because Barnes has been through all of this for so long that he, he doesn't need that the way a younger coach would need, would need that. I mean, that's not a knock on Jeremy Pruitt. I'm sure Rick Barnes needed somebody when he was just getting started to say, hey, coach, take a deep breath here. Not everything is Armageddon. You know, not every disagreement is an Armageddon fight on something. I, I, don't you think that's just part of the oh, maturing process? I, I, I think totally. And, you know, doing it for 30 years, I mean, he, he has a program that, how, you know, that he's going to run a certain way. And he, people, you know, he may change schools, but people, he's going to put people in the same roles that he's had in this program and things are going to function. You know, everybody's going to know what's important, what the standards are. And I would say, you know, to the, you know, Mary Carter, Niffin is probably the you know closest person to that kind of chief of staff on um, Tennessee's side. I guess her title is director of basketball operations, but she really handles everything off the court, you know, travel, meals, making sure you know kids, you know, coordinating things with the Thornton Center. I mean, she's in this. I mean, Rick never has to think about any of that stuff. All right, let's go to LF Vol. Would you agree our offense has is to be? is to be kind, stale, and we have trouble getting receivers open. First of all, do you think our AD feels the same way or does he rationalize it that it's just quarterback play? Secondly, after repeatedly watching Alabama, Ole Miss, and Florida scheme guys wide open in the passing game, why would we not incorporate some of those innovative designs in our playbook? And yes, I know Alabama has a different level of old, uh, athlete, but not Ole Miss, for example. I, you know, I, I think a couple things here, and, and I want everybody to chime in on this. I think if you look at Jim Cheney's first year, um, there were certainly plays where he schemed guys up wide open. Um, and, you know, it just wasn't executed. Obviously, can, the run play up Florida comes to mind with Dominic Wood that. Anderson. Uh, but, but there are some other plays. Alabama, yeah. came completely wide open, and JG didn't get within a mile of him. So, there, there, I mean, there's, there's certainly some quarterback play that's involved there. I think this year – you have to throw the wide receivers into that mix as well um, because maybe they didn't mentally play as well as they needed to play to know what to do all the time. Um, and then I think there's an element, Austin, that Jim Chaney's a bit stale as well. So, I mean, I think it's, I think it's kind of all things. I think the receivers this year, I think quarterback play both years. And, and I don't think Jim Chaney had a, a great year calling football plays this year. No, he didn't, you know, and whether it's, you know, somebody like a Joe Osavet or them bringing in, you know, just a new voice on the offensive side or whatever, I, I don't think that that hurts things. I mean, like, you know, again, you know, Joe Brady was, you know, got all the love last year. Was he the end-all, be-all for LSU? I, maybe, maybe not. Point is, is he brought new ideas and just kind of a fresh coat of paint to their offense. And they did, you know, it did help them tremendously. So, you know, uh, th this offense could use a fresh coat of paint. It does have playmakers. He makes breaks, brings up a good point. Ole Miss has got players, but they don't have, you know, I mean, uh, is Tennessee's you know, receivers and, and athletes, you know, worse than Ole Miss's or, or any better or whatever else? I mean, like, I, the point is, is like they, they've done a nice job of using their athletes, getting them in space, getting them in, met, in, in mismatches and uh, creating matchup problems against defenses. And I'll say this. Lane Kiffin is one of the best wide receiver coaches I've ever seen and I've ever dealt with. Kippy Brown was great. He's the best I've ever dealt with. But when it comes to scheming stuff up and getting a receiver ready, a young receiver ready, he's much more gifted as a receiver's coach than he is as a quarterback developer or anything like that. You go look at his track record from USC to everywhere he's been, receivers have been a mainstay, and it's because of him. He, he's, a, he's a very good wide receiver's coach. Very good. Very underrated um, as a wide receivers coach. Do I, do I think Philip Fulmer wants to run the football, though, which is kind of what this guy was asking, I think, and hinting around at? Yes. I think at the end of the day, Philip Fulmer is always going to want to run the football. Um, I, I don't think he wants to throw it 60 times a game. I think he wants to line up and run it. Now, he wants to be more explosive, you know, than they were, and he wants to throw it, too, but he wants to run the football and be able to run the football because that's the root of his offensive philosophy and always has been. All right, UT sports man. always will be. I mean, like at this point in this time, he, he just ain't changing yeah. what he thinks. No, and that doesn't mean that he's three yards in a cloud of dust. I mean, you go back and look at his offenses when he was offensive coordinator. 
you know, they threw the football. They were explosive. I mean, they were in four and five wide sets. I mean, it wasn't like he lined up and, you know, ran <laughs> fullback dive on you all the time. Uh, but but he wanted to ha- always have an element of being able to run the football. And, um, you know, I, I think in order to be successful in this league, you have to be able to line up and run the football. So, I mean, you got to throw it much better than Tennessee did, but you got to be able to line up and run it. And Tennessee didn't do either one of them, either one of those things well enough this year. Uh, offensively and that's why they've got to fix that starting with the quarterback some schematics but they've got a lot to fix on that side of the ball uh, for sure I think um, philosophically covered do you agree that would I mean not just coach Fuller but any quote old school football coach the problem they have with or the you know concern they have with, with moving towards you know just you know throwing all over the field offense is not so much that they don't they're not opposed to passing I think they feel like you lose the physicality like you lose the the edge if you turn yourself into one of those guys that but and I think what we've seen from LSU and Alabama the last two years is they have managed to turn themselves into one of those high octane offense offenses without losing that that physicality like Alabama can still line it up and get three yards on third and two yeah Alabama absolutely can still line up and run the football and LSU could line up and run the football with Joe Brady when when he was the quarterback they could still line up and run the football and and do things that way absolutely um, and, and, and that's part of it. I mean, Philip Fulmer, <laughs> Philip Fulmer wants to see the five man block and sled on the practice field. Okay. He wants the, he wants his offensive lines using those things every day because there's an element of physicality there and pass pro and in run blocking that he never wants to be compromised by any kind of offensive scheme. Um, UT sportsman 16 wants to know, has the administration had any back channel communication with potential coaching candidates in the event they have to fire Pruitt? Certainly, you would think they would form a plan as this investigation has moved on. I'm not aware of any back-channel communications because, boy, that looks bad if you have that. I asked Auburn how that looked when they went and saw Bobby Petrino when Tommy Tuberville was their coach years ago. Um, have they had discussions? I'm sure that there's, you know, I'm sure that some names have probably been discussed at some point. That's probably always, should always be in, in an AD's pocket. But, no, I don't think Tennessee's had any back channel communications at this point in time with any potential candidate out there because as Austin said you know repeatedly at this point in time Jeremy Pruitt remains Tennessee's football coach and I think that's where the focus is and has been and will be until this investigation is over and we see what the results of of that is moving forward. Well I mean because at the end of the day I mean I get it we live in a world where everybody wants to speculate about two years from now much less in the current moment but you know, I use this analogy on the Swain show on Tuesday. I feel like when we're, when we're talking about all these hypotheticals, it's like, you know, mom and going, yeah, I know you're not dead yet, but you know, when you die, I'd like to get that vase and that, uh, that ironing board and, and, and whatever from your house. You know, I mean, like it just, I mean, again, I get why we do it. It just, some of the hypotheticals are just, I, it's hard for me to talk about them because, because some of it's just like, you know, it's got to, you know, you got to have three things happen before you can get to that hypothetical and, and play. I don't disagree with that at all. Um, but again, I understand why people are asking the questions, but um, we'll just wait and see what happens. I think that's the best way to say it at this point in time. Rocky top 73, Rob, can you succinctly describe what the top eight to 10 players define role is on this year's basketball team? I've heard that expression used a lot. Add some meat to the bone, please. What does that mean? Minutes is what it means. Is what it, what it means when I talk about it. If you're talking about you know defined roles, I mean, not I'm not talking about you know shooters scores. I mean, it, it goes without saying that Cam Wad and, and uh, Anasiki. I mean, if you're talking about on the court defined roles, it's not to shoot the basketball ever, unless you're just point blank right at the rim off an offensive rebound or something. But when I talk about defined roles, and when Rick, when Coach Barnes talks about defined roles, he's talking about minutes primarily, like what the rotation is going to look like behind his top seven. I mean, those the top seven guys are going to play between twenty and thirty minutes a game. I mean, we all know who those are: the five starters and whoever between Keon and, and Jaden or. Bailey is, is starts the game on the bench. I think what he, what he's trying to figure out right now is is Anasiki getting twelve minutes? Is is Camwa getting those twelve minutes? Is is Plavic a factor at all? And go back and look at the last you know two or three games. It's clear that Rick is still working through that. 
Bruce Fall wants to know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, y'all laughed off a poster's question when asked if the athletic department cared by pointing out how much money they had spent. Well, what's the reason why Tennessee's in the position they're in? If it's not a lack of caring, is it because they're just dumb? Um, I don't think it's because they're dumb. I think there's a variety of things that float in there. One, you got to get the right guy in place. Okay, you got to make you got to make the right hire. This program has not had stability. This university has not had any stability. Um, I don't think you just throw money at it and say that's fixed. Okay, there are other things. You hear coaches talk about this all the time, rowing in the same direction, and that's a tired phrase. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means little things like you know, extra tutoring hours after hours, you know, and, and not just middle in the middle of the day. Um, that's your cafeteria situation during, um, fall break and, or, or during, you know, winter break, how are you doing that? Oh. Your you, summertime, are you doing the same number of meals that way? It's a hey, not leaking out, you know, news that you're having an internal investigation going on, right? It's keeping those things quiet. I mean, those are things that are, some of the areas of commitment where Tennessee's got to get better. Because, Rob, I don't think you just write a check and say we fixed it because we wrote a check. I think that's been proven. Would anybody would anybody accuse Alabama of, of not caring enough? I mean, what go back and look at them from, you know, 2000 to whenever, you know, Saban got there. Is that because, you know, were, were they, did, you know, did Phillip beat Alabama seven times in a row because Alabama didn't care or because they made some bad coach not? Yeah, it's a great way to put it. You know, you gotta get the right, you gotta get the right guy in there, and and Tennessee's not been able to get and, and sustain anything um, moving forward. Either when they've had a head coach that's just, that's been able to do a job, he hasn't, you know, appears to have been able to run a program. He's done, he's not put the right staff together with it. He's made the wrong coaching hire, uh, which has led to a demise. And, you know, and and so it's things like that, Austin. Other than just saying you need more money and you need a bigger staff. Well, perfect example is just all the stars have to align. You know, you know, sometimes Butch made bad decisions as, 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 as running the program, just like sometimes Jeremy's made bad decisions. But then there are other, you know, factors out there that you guys just discussed that hurt you, like, you know, tutoring from in the morning time instead of after practice. When I was in school, most of the tutoring went on after practice. You know, when, you know, the, all the players would go to the Thornton Center or wherever after practice. So, you know, seven, eight, nine o'clock. Now, while the, the tutoring goes on during the day when kids don't have classes, well, you know, this is not an excuse, but I mean, like if you're, you know, 19 year old kid and you've sat there and you've been tutoring these classes that you really struggle in and you're mentally fried by the time you get to your position, you know, meeting room, you know, I mean, like how, how really kind of in tune with what's going on are you? Or are you just like, oh, God, I just ready to just, you know, just get me out there to the field. Well, you know, you, you, you take, you know, a little bit of time off in, in the meeting room, that affects how you practice. You know, for example, is a guy like Jim Turner. You know, Tennessee couldn't hire Jim Turner because of his past. That's been well documented on our board. Well, don't be surprised if Jim Turner is not the next offensive line coach at Alabama. Well, and if, look, so, and if, if Tennessee couldn't hire him, don't bring him in. Don't, don't interview him. Don't even, don't even go down that road. I mean, you, no. you get you, you got it. You got. I, I know your point. I'm making. A, I'm making a point as well. I, I, and I'm not glossing over saying your point is wrong. You got to understand where you are. You know what I mean? You get. You get. You, you got to. You know. You can't bring a guy in for an interview and and nobody knows who the guy is and or not enough people. Not the right people know who he is and all of a sudden they see you know stories online. Well, what are you doing bringing this guy in? I mean, you got to get everybody on the same page on all fronts. You know. And and you're right. I mean there's a chance Jim Turner lines up somewhere in the SEC, um, you know, and, and that's just, that's part of it. Um, so again, my point in all of this is that the answer is not just throwing more money at it. You, you got to fix some things that doesn't, that, that does not cost you money, but you got to fix some things to get it all aligned the way it needs to be aligned, uh, rolling and moving forward. And everybody's got to cooperate and work on that. And, and that's Tennessee's challenge moving forward. I mean, I well, I mean, perfect example is Texas, okay? Texas just hired a guy that literally, you know, was intoxicated out on the field. The practice field. <laughs> the practice field, you know. I mean, but, but my point is, is like, you know, I'm not saying that they're more committed to winning, whatever you want to, however you want to phrase this, you know, but I mean, like, 
you know, they're going to make that higher. There are other similar hires out there in college football, but then, you know, someplace like Tennessee is going to, you know, stand on their high horse about something Jim Turner did from, you know, again, all these guys, you know, I mean, even a guy like Hugh Freeze, I'm, I've said you know, several times on Birmingham radio this week, you know, the, the guy's going to end up as a power five coach at some point because somebody's going to take a chance on him and say, you know, I know you screwed up. I've talked to you. I still feel good about where we can get with you. And I feel like you're not going to do it again. Let's go to David K. 10. Who do you think was really behind the steel hire, Pruitt or Fulmer? Pruitt. Jeremy Pruitt started this conversation first. Yeah. Now, do I think that Philip was like, yeah, let's get him in here? Yeah. And, I believe and I that. Think, and I think Philip helped get it done. I think Philip helped put his shit across the finish line. But this is, I mean, Jeremy Pruitt's absolutely on board with Kevin Steele being here. And, and he started the conversation. The first, the first call to Kevin's or the first talk to Kevin Steele about, being at Tennessee did not come from Philip Fulmer, did not come from a donor or anybody else. It came directly from Jeremy Pruitt. I believe that 100% without any question and based on everybody that I've talked to. And, and Hub, I mean, am I making too much of it? Is it, I mean, given the, the landscape, is it not maybe one of the most bizarre things that's ever happened when you try to interpret it, interpret what it yes. means in the bigger picture? Well, that I mean, it, yeah. it is to me. Oh, no question. I mean, there, there's no question that that's the case. And, I mean, because Kevin Steele could have gotten a, a lot of jobs, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Like, On the surface, if you just look at it, it doesn't make any sense that Kevin Steele would take this job. If Jeremy's in limbo, yeah, which just, I think we all believe he's in limbo. It just doesn't make sense. I think if it had been if, – if this situation – if Kevin Steele had been presented this situation at LSU – Anywhere but Tennessee. Anywhere but Tennessee, exactly right. He would have said no. Tennessee's why he came back here because I think emotionally there's a heart tug to fix his school. Now he's moved on. He's, you know, he, he's had a bunch of, <laughs> a bunch of hats from a bunch of different schools, but at the end of the day, I think he probably looks and says, what in the world's wrong with Tennessee? Can I help him? Can I help Jeremy Pruitt? Can I help Tennessee first and foremost? And, and he's how also can got, I help him? Also got a signed guaranteed contract. And he's also got, he got fired at Auburn, which means he's got all that money coming too. So I mean, he, he he's he's fine. He's got a nice little landing landing strip on this deal without any question. Um, all right, a couple more before we get out the door here. Uh, do you think Jeremy Pruitt is upset with how the investigation has been handled? Also, do you think his relationship with the university going forward will be strained, even if it comes out clean? Yes, and yes. I, I mean, like, I I I think that ultimately, you know, he would prefer he would have preferred it been handled differently. Um, you know, and I, I you know, I, I do believe that it, it's fractured. Like, you know, even if, 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 if he's retained, I think, I won't say set up to fail, but I think that, you know, that, that his road to success is made much tougher by all of this, period. And I think he knows it. Yeah. A couple basketball or basketball question here. Who are the biggest basketball targets in the 22 class besides B.J. Edwards? Do we still lead there? Any idea when he might make a commitment or might make a decision, Rob? Uh, I don't know when he's going to make a decision, but I think Tennessee is in great, great, great shape. Is that the is that the fifty hubs gift? That's <laughs> I'm not going to go. I'm not not going that far, but I think Tennessee. I don't think Tennessee could be positioned any better. So that's the gift where you like snap your head around and then smile again. The uh, and then Brandon Huntley Hatfield. I'm you know I thought for a long time that he was he was a, he he would reclassify and he still may, but I, I think that the momentum behind that is is, is slowing down a little bit because if you're looking around the country, a lot of kids who did that last year are freshmen right now are, are struggling a little bit. A lot of highly rated guys. I wouldn't rule it out with Hatfield. I'm not saying that, but I think seeing um, the way a couple of guys who did reclass have, have not had great starts in their freshman season. I think that's given him a little pause. Um, Tomba, the kid at Catholic. I mean, he's not a super highly rated guy, but that's a kid. That's a kid that Tennessee likes a lot that they're, pushing hard for um, seven, you know, seven foot guy. That's, a, that's a little bit of a project, but has a ton of upside. Uh, the Brandon Miller kid and um, in Nashville, certainly a, a guy that they're pushing hard for. Uh, there's a kid, there's a kid at Christ school over in North Carolina where Fulkerson is from. And I'm blanking on his name right now, but uh, he's a guy that, that has a firm offer from Tennessee. That's been on campus for an unofficial visit. Um, those would be guys just off the top of my head that I, I would throw out there as, as 22, takes right now all right let's uh recruiting question to you austin if 
Tennessee were to land Rodney Garner along with Kevin Steele, could some of the defensive players in the portal at Auburn end up here? Got to think Big Cat Bryant would, would be a possibility with all the connections. Yes, I think Big Cat Bryant, uh, but, you know, between he and then Shelton Felton, you know, in fact, he played high school ball for Shelton. So I, that, that, you know, to me, that's a uh, underrated part of this. So I would say Tennessee is the favorite to land Big Cat Bryant, barring uh, just, you know, something going on here and then him getting squeezy about, you know, coming into this, uh, to the program with, the, with, the, with all the stuff that's going around it. Yep, certainly would be the case. Again, we don't know exactly what's going to happen with the one-time transfer rule for other guys in the transfer portal. Be interesting to see if anybody pulls their names out of there or what happens with that. I think there's, what, 7,000 kids in there, 2,000 football players. Yeah, I've read, I, did, did I read this? 89 quarterbacks? Yeah, 89 quarterbacks is, is the number. It's the it thing to do, baby. Yep, it is the it thing to do. All right, last question. We're out the door. Would love your opinions on the lack of parity in college football. It's worse than women's basketball at this point. Are there any tweaks that can be made to stop the rich from getting richer? Are we assuming dynasties are always um, uh, cyclical and this will eventually end? Is it as simple as waiting for Saban to retire? While expanding the playoff would give more programs greater interest later into the season, would that not just lead to um, those schools, Bama, Clemson, Ohio State, clobbering the 7-8 seeds? I don't see that fixing anything else. Did you ever imagine in your lifetime a coach winning six national championships in 11 years, having never had a season under 10 wins for 13 straight years? What do you attribute his success to? Best players in college football. Yeah. Look at the NFL draft <laughs> since, Saban got, since Saban got to Alabama. I mean, I once he got it rolling, I mean, it's honestly like a lot like Dabo. Dabo's doing it a different, a, a little bit of a different way and, and different. Um, obviously, the success is, is different because he's not playing the SEC. He's not playing the SEC schedule. And he still takes the occasional three star. Well, yes, he does. Um, yeah, I mean, so does Alabama though. They took a kid from uh, South Carolina a couple years ago. that was a three star. Took a kid, uh, you know, from Louisiana that was a three star. They, they do too. They, like they took Josh Jacobs when he was a what? Like, what, was he a two star? Three? I mean, three star? He was. He was. I know he wasn't highly rated. Until he committed. Um, you know, I, I think that the thing that nobody talks about with, with Saban is his ability to adapt and adjust to the, evol to the ever-evolving game, which is why they haven't been cyclical. If they were still trying to play 13, 10 football games, then they would have a chance to lose. But he's adapted as the rules have changed and put more of an emphasis on offense, and so they've been able to stay – at the top with those best players because think, of the way that they're trying to play football. I think he deserves a tremendous credit. There's actually a great, you know, great article on exactly what you're talking about, Brent. It's up on, on the ringer.com that, I mean, those, you know, really dives into detail about how Saban, you know, several years ago when he was crying and whining about the no huddle, hurry up and all that. He's like, is that, is that the kind of football you, you all really want to see? And at the time it kind of sounded, you know, the, the, the author said at the time it sounded like he was, you know, complaining or whining, but in hindsight, it looks like he was like, okay, if that's what you want to see, <laughs> here it comes. Yeah. And I, I, in terms of getting parity, you know, more parity. And I mean, the ACC, let's look at it this way for, for the ACC or for Clemson, somebody in the ACC has got to be competitive. Okay. They, they've got to make it more competitive in the ACC. To, I mean, nobody's even trying to catch Clemson right now in that, in that regard. Um, you know, in, in the Big Ten, Ohio, I mean, if you want Ohio State to get slowed down a little bit, Michigan needs to be a bigger factor. They need to be more competitive than, than what they've been. So that, you know, that's on the Big Ten, I think, to, to amp some things up in, in that conference a little bit. Um, and then, you know, I don't think we'll see anybody doing what Nick Saban does after he retires. I just don't see uh, – nobody's going to manage it and, and run a program and have the success that he's had. So – um, it's probably not going to stop their dynasty until he does retire. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, and I agree with him on the playoff. I think if you add a bunch of teams to the playoff, you're going to get a bunch of opening round blow, blow up, blowouts um, is what I think you're going to end up with. Um, and it's not good for the game. I think the game needs more parity than what it has right now. I think it would be better for college football if you didn't have the same two or three teams every year, um, you know, in the playoff and playing for the national championship. So Anyway, good question, good discussion there on that one. That's a little bit outside of what's going on at Tennessee. We'll continue to track everything that's going on at Tennessee, try to bring you the very latest. 
Uh, keep an eye on the transfer portal, keep an eye on coaching hires, and keep an eye on this investigation that maybe is coming to somewhat of a close at the end of this week. So keep it locked into VolQuest for all the latest on that. That's going to do is it. For that, this is that, are you at the Winfrey Hotel right now, Hubs? The Winfrey? No, man, I'm at that uh, micro, that little micro lodge there at, just outside Gadsden, Alabama. Uh, couldn't get back on the plane there. Uh, that's going to do it for this edition of the VolQuest.com podcast presented by Blue Water Climate Control. For Austin Price and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Thursday, everybody.